Today is the culmination of the High Holy Days. The ten days of awe, the days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, for today is Yom Kippur. On Rosh Hashanah, the trumpets were sounded, and we declared the King is coming. And Yom Kippur is the day of the crowning, the final crowning of the king. He is crowned on, on Rosh Hashanah as the king, but on Yom Kippur he takes his place on the throne. We're set up a little different because Yom Kippur is a very different day. Um, it's not your normal Sabbath. <laughs> I'm looking for a prayer that I thought I had marked and apparently I hadn't, so maybe we'll just have to do that one tonight. Um, there's a place... There is an understanding, a small understanding of Yom Kippur in the Christian community. This is probably the one festival that the most people ask, why do you observe Yom Kippur? Wasn't it finished? When Yeshua died on the cross, he said, it is finished. Didn't that seal it for all time? Do we really still need to be doing Yom Kippur? The payment for the sin is finished. But is the king sitting on his throne yet? And if the king is not yet sitting on his throne, ought we not to continue to do those things that he commanded us to do that declared the king will be sitting on his throne? And that's one of the reasons we continue to observe Yom Kippur. We have set the sanctuary up quite differently, and, and it's a little problematic because we don't have a big room, we don't have a lot of air, um, and so it's a bit problematic for us that I know that God said to do this. It's what we're doing, <laughs> and I believe he's going to honor it. On the table as you came in, there were some papers. Craig, I'm going to need one of each of those papers. I forgot to bring them up. These papers outline some of what we do for Yom Kippur, some of our remembrances, some of how we observe it. In Judaism, it's observed as a day of fasting. And the sad truth, thank you, dear. The sad truth is that in Judaism today, it is taught that by fasting, we will obtain forgiveness for sin. That, that because the temple is no longer intact and there's no more blood sacrifice, that by fasting on Yom Kippur, we will attain the atonement. That is what is taught in Judaism today. I will tell you that is a lie from the pit of hell. It is a lie from the pit of hell because it contradicts the Torah. Torah said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no atonement. Fasting does not earn us salvation. Fasting will not give us atonement. The shedding of blood is what brings atonement to us. So then why do we fast? There are five areas of fasting that are, that are rabbinically ordered. These five areas of fasting have been in place since the time of Ezra and the great council that he called together when he reestablished the temple in Jerusalem. We can't blame the Pharisees of Yeshua's day 
for the service of Yom Kippur. It was established by Ezra and Joshua, the high priest of his day, the one we read about in the book of Ezra, that we read about in Nehemiah. We read about them, and we read about their reestablishing of the sacrificial system, and we read about God saying to them, it's not the sacrifice that I seek, it's your obedience. When he stood, God oh, wasn't counting on going here. But I have to. Okay, where is it? <laughs> Is it Zechariah or Habakkuk? It will be Zechariah. There it is. Zechariah chapter three. I knew it was either, I knew it was one of the two. I wasn't planning on going here, but the Lord has told me about this. He's reminded me. In part because of the teaching that it's that 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 the, it's the process that brings salvation. It's not even the process the high priest went through that brought salvation. In chapter three of Zechariah, it says, "Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord." and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem. May the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not the man, a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. Now I want to ask you a question. Was the priest ever allowed to go into the temple in filthy clothes? He was not. He never went into the outer court in filthy clothes, let alone into the inner court to stand before the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is at the Ark of the Covenant. When we say he stood before the angel of the Lord, he is standing at the Ark of the Covenant. Let me tell you what he did before he got there as the high priest, before he got there as the high priest on Yom Kippur, because that's the only day he's allowed to stand before the angel of the Lord in the Ark. Before he ever got there, he stood in the outer courtyard and he took a bull. And he brought a bull, and he brought lambs, and he brought goats, and we'll read the exact outline in a little bit, or you could actually, you can read them for yourselves. I've put little papers on the table that have where it's outlined at it. And in Leviticus and Numbers, it outlines the basic program. There, there were seven lambs sacrificed on this day. There was a bull offered for the sin of the high priest. He offered the bull offering. He came through and he sprinkled incense on the altar. He offered another bull offering. He offered an offering for himself. He offered an offering for his family. He offered an offering for his tribe, the tribe of Levi. Then he offered an offering for the nation of Israel. And before Yeshua's time, it was outlined that he added there was one more offering that was made. These are bulls that were sacrificed at the brazen altar. So we are at five bulls. That's a lot of slaughter in one day. The fifth bull, the fifth one he sacrificed at the brazen altar was for the world. People we don't get it that we're covered in the Old Testament. Just because we're Goyim, just because we're Gentiles, does not mean God does not love us. God provided the sacrifice for the world, 
not just the Jewish nation. All five were offered. He offered seven lambs, and two goats were brought before him. With the offering of each bull, he laid his hand on the head of the bull, and he confessed the sins that were to be going before God with each one. And he would go out before the people with two goats, one on his right hand and one on his left hand. They were to be perfect goats, pure and spotless. And they cast the dice for which goat was going to be sacrificed in the temple and which was for Azazel, which was to be driven out of the city, out into the desert of sin and off a cliff taking the goat out. Generations of the casting of the lots for choosing the goat. And for generations from the time of Ezra on, the, cast, the lot fell to the right hand. The goat on the right hand. The goat on the right hand. He would take and he would sacrifice the goat at the altar and he would lay his hands on the one to be driven out and he would confess the sins of the people. And as he took the blood from the sacrifice at the altar and he went in to the Holy of Holies, they drove the other goat out of the city. They, they took him out of the city, out into the desert, out into the wilderness of sin in an area called Azazel. By the time of Yeshua, they had it down pat. They knew exactly where to take him when he would fall off the cliff. By the time the priest had offered the incense and had been translated into the Holy of Holies, and I said translated on purpose because there's no opening in the tent, how else did he get through? He was to offer the incense and be, have the incense be so thick that he couldn't see his hand in front of his face, and he would walk through the curtain into the Holy of Holies, that holiest place. He would do this having put on fresh, pure, white linen. Slaughter is a bloody practice. You cannot slaughter an animal without getting blood on your garments. Is that not correct? It'd be pretty hard, especially if you're dealing with bulls and lambs and goats. He would come in and he would bathe and change his clothes just before he came on in and offered the incense and went up into the Holy of Holies. He had on pure white linen, only the white linen when he stood before God. But this says that Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. I don't care how clean we wash ourselves. When we stand before the angel of God, it doesn't matter how much we scrub. It doesn't matter what oil we put on. It doesn't matter whether we fast. It doesn't matter what we do. Nothing is good enough to stand as a human being. Nothing takes away the residue of the sin that we've walked in. Nothing can take away the residue except for this. The angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. And he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin. And I will put rich garments on you. Then I, Zechariah, who was observing this, said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. 
And the angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you a place among these standing here. Listen, O high priest Joshua, and your associates seated before you, who are men of symbolic things to come. What are they men of? That which is to come. I am going to bring my servant the branch. See the stone that I have set in front of Joshua? There are seven eyes on that one stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty. And I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. In that day, each of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and his fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. And that's a hint to the next festival, by the way, which is the festival of Super. It doesn't matter what we do. We cannot stand before God in our own garments. We have to have our garments changed by the angel of the Lord. How do we have our garments changed by the angel of the Lord? Because it said, I'm going to send my servant the branch. I'm going to send my Messiah. The fasting that we do is not about salvation. It's about obedience. It's about the commandment of the Lord that on this day you are to afflict, afflict yourselves, afflict your souls. And the word soul represents the self, the physical body, the nephesh, which is part of why we fast. Because in the Torah, in, in the Hebrew, we're to afflict our, our physical body, we're to afflict our appetites. How do we afflict our appetites? By denying them, by fasting. The five things that we fast, by the way, five is a very significant number. Five is the number of grace. Five is the number of grace. And so I find it interesting that five things are fasted for Yom Kippur, representing, again, the grace of God. The first is work. We abstain from our regular work. By doing this, we declare it's not that we're doing it in order to gain atonement. It's that we do it to declare our total dependence on God for our lives. He's our provider. God is our provider. My job is not my provider. I love my job. I really do. I love my job. But that's not my provider. God is my provider. We abstain from eating and drinking, food and drink. When we do that, if you abstain from food and drink very long, would you be alive still? No. <laughs> By abstaining from food and drink, we declare our dependence on God for sustaining our lives. We abstain from the washing of lotions and oils. You'll notice the oils that we usually have set out for people to anoint themselves are covered. Today we don't anoint ourselves with oil. Because oil is a comfort in life. Oil makes us smell good, it makes us feel good. Today is the day that we abstain from that because we want to depend on God for comfort in our lives, not the outside things. Another thing abstained from on Yom Kippur is marital relations. By abstaining from that, we're declaring dependence on God as a source of new life as the source of new life. We abstain from wearing leather shoes, declaring our dependence on God for the way we walk out our lives. These are the things that we abstain from, and this is why we abstain from these things. It's all on this paper. It's not about earning anything. It's about declaring dependence on God. I make a declaration. I depend on God and God alone. And as I said, the sad reality for me 
is that in Judaism today, it's taught that by fasting on Yom Kippur, you earn salvation for the year. You cannot earn salvation for the year. Your name cannot be written in the Lamb's Book of Life by fasting. It was written by the shedding of blood. The shedding of blood. In Hebrews, now we're going to get back to worship in a minute because that's really what I want to do more today. Hebrews chapter 10, the law is a shadow of good things that are coming. Was Hebrews written before or after Yeshua died? Who was written after? <laughs> so when he says of good things that are coming, there's still good things coming. <laughs> it's not all here yet. The law is the shadow. They are not the realities themselves. But for this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifice repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshiper would have been cleansed once and for all, and no longer felt guilty for the sins. But these sacrifices are an annual reminder of sin, because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Therefore, when the anointed one, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Savior, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. And then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. And I have come to do your will, O oh God. As we walk through today, and it's open all day long, we're going to go back to worship, but I'm just going to allow people to do exactly what we've set up to do. <laughs> Which is to be priests before God. To be priests before God. The word says that we are a royal priesthood, are we not? The priest before God on this day would come with repentance and petitions of prayer for the people. First for himself, then for his family, the Kohen, then for the Levites, then for the tribe of Israel, and then for the world. What I'm asking us to do today is walk in identificational repentance. Identificational repentance. Had the priest himself committed every sin that he confessed on the head of the lamb? No, he had not. But he stood there and he confessed that sin as if it was his own. I've got little pieces of paper over there in front of the, our makeshift altar. <laughs> And a little notebook. Take a couple pieces of paper. Start with yourself. Are there any sins that I need to confess before the Lord? We are told in 1 John 1, 9 if, that if we will confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from our unrighteousness. And if we say we have no sin, we make God a liar. So no one can tell me there's no sin that they've committed that they need to confess before God. I've been there half the morning myself <laughs> before anybody got here. We all have sin. We confess first for ourselves. Take the lid off and we will burn the papers before the Lord as a representation of the sin burning before God, as a representation, a reminder of the offering made once for all. But we will confess our sins. And we'll wash our hands in the labor that's provided. And if you want to, you can come on through the door into the holy place. <laughs> that's the outer court. This is the holy place, the inner court. And there's a little coal in a, burnt, in a incense burner right there. There's incense in a cup. And you can take and sprinkle some incense before the altar of the Lord. Up here, I have next to them uh, more pieces of paper. Those pieces of paper are for your prayer requests. The incense represents the prayer of the people. What do I need? I need confession. I need forgiveness. But there's other things I need as well. 
that's a place to write them down. Not just for yourself, but then you can go back through and for your family. Confess the sins of your family. Ask the Lord what to confess. You might be surprised what he puts in your mind. Write it down, put it in. Doesn't matter if you've committed it or not. Doesn't matter if you know it in reality or not. If the Holy Spirit brings it to you, confess it. Offer it to the Lord. Watch him break the generational curses in your family in the coming year if you will do this. I've watched it happen in mine. This is a way of breaking those generational curses. This is, prayer is a form of spiritual warfare. Did you know that? And this is a form. For your family, wash, come through, offer incense, sit down and write out prayer requests for your family. Fold them up and put them in the bowl. You can go back through. I consider for my, for my tribe would be this community, the city of Klamath Falls or the basin of Klamath, where I live. That's the tribe I live in. Confessing the sins of our community. Watch them go up and smoke. Wash your hands. Put the incense in the fire. Come before the Lord and write down the requests you have for this city. Fold them up and put them in there. Go back through. Our nation has tons of things to confess before the Lord. We will confess them as if we have done them ourselves. One of the first ones I've written on there every year has been the sin of abortion, the sin of killing our unborn children. God, someday you are going to rid our nation of this horrible sin. He will do it when we confess before God. When we've completed all for the nation, and that might take you a while. We come through again. Write down your requests for this nation. Put them in the bowl. Come back through. And for the world. Do it as often as you can, as much as you need to. Not everybody has to do it this way. It's just an opportunity. An opportunity to walk through a time of repentance before the Lord. While we're doing this, we're also going to be worshiping before the Lord. You can worship in your seat. You can get on your face. It does. You do what God instructs you to do. Those that are normal in our fellowship know, I don't direct you. I worship. You're welcome to join me in any way you can, in any way you want to, whether it's using flags or instruments of praise. But today is a solemn day, and so we're refraining from the dance. Sorry. <laughs> But it is a solemn day, remembering the sacrifice, remembering the sin, bringing all of this before God. At the conclusion of the day, when we come back, we're going to take all of the requests that are there, that have been brought. That's why I'm asking you, fold them if you don't want anyone to know what it is. And we're going to burn them in the altar. And let those prayer requests go up before God in a symbolic fashion. Here's the prayer the high priest prayed. And I have it right there on a paper before the thing. The pattern that he followed, the high priest would draw near the animal and facing the sanctuary, he would place his two hands on the bullock's head between its horns and he confessed. I beseech you, O Lord, I have sinned and rebelled and transgressed against you, I and my household. I beseech you, O Lord, grant atonement for the sins and for the iniquities and transgressions which I have committed against you, I and my household. As it is written in the Torah of your servant Moses, for on this day atonement shall be made for you to purify you from all your sins. Before the Lord, you shall be purified. By the shedding of blood, there is remission of sin. The shedding of blood took place on Calvary. Yeshua, our Messiah, has taken his blood before the altar in heaven. 
I don't know that everything is completed there, but I know that what's done on the earth is a picture of what's done in the tabernacle in the heavenlies. But on this day, we remember the sacrifice for us. We remember our sin. When we celebrate Passover, we, remember, we celebrate the deliverance of the people. But when we celebrate Yom Kippur, we remember our sin, which is part of why we need the deliverance. I'm going to start worshiping. I love it. And join me in worship and song. Join me in prayer. Join me however you need to. <laughs> We're going to do Jesus Messiah. To start with.